world was created by the word of God, recreated by his redemption, and it is continually renewed by his love. Rejoicing in him, we call out, renew the wonders of your love, Lord. We give thanks to God whose power is revealed in nature and whose providence is revealed in history. The, the wonders, wonders of, of your love, Lord. Lord. Through your Son, the herald of reconciliation, the victor of, cro of the cross, free us from empty fear and hopelessness. Renew the, the wonders, wonders of your love, Lord. May all those who love and pursue justice work together without deceit to build a world of true peace. Renew, Renew the, the wonders, wonders of your love, Lord. Be with the oppressed, free the captives, console the sorrowing, feed the hungry, strengthen the weak. In all people, reveal the victory of your cross. Reveal the wonders of your love, Lord. After your son's death and burial, you raised him up again in glory. Grant that the faithful departed may live with him. Renew, Renew the, the wonders, wonders of, of your love, love Lord. And now we pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the merits and desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. May Almighty God bless you and remain with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us bless the Lord. Welcome to everyone to Lectio Divina as we begin once more, this time in our newly restored cathedral. I think those who have been watching on television over the last few years have noticed uh, quite a jungle of uh, scaffolding and things like that. Well, that's all gone and the cathedral is restored and rededicated and uh, we're very glad to be, to be back. During this year, uh, I've reflected upon the themes to use, which portions of scripture to use for Lectio Divina. It has not been a problem the last three years because we have gone through the whole of the Gospel of Mark from start to finish. But now that is finished and I, I think what to do. So I have thought that it would be a good idea to look at the theme of the freedom of the kingdom of God. And what that means is that the Lord comes, he says, repent, for the kingdom of God is near at hand. It is the presence of the Lord God in our midst that gives us freedom from the various things which so enslave us day by day. And it's in our own personal experience of liberation from the chains that bind us that we can be freed to see the vision of God and to become what God wants us to be. 
And so I thought the freedom of the kingdom of God, it could also be called repent, for the kingdom of God is near at hand. And I think it's maybe appropriate as we are coming to the end of the year of mercy to reflect upon that essential context of mercy, which is inner conversion, coming before the Lord. As we experience the embrace of the father upon the road, the prodigal son looks back to the moment of grace when in his heart, when he said, I will arise and go to my father. And that's the moment of liberation fulfilled when he experiences the mercy of the father, but which is really touches his heart profoundly as he turns back home, home again, onward home. So what to reflect upon? Here are some of the themes we'll be using. This evening I'll be looking at original sin, at the temptation and of Adam and Eve, the temptation in the garden, the fall. It speaks to us so powerfully of who we are and of the way in which we can become caught up in so many different binding chains and cords that as St. Augustine said, our temptations and sins are like little threads so slight we do not notice them until they become ropes so strong that we cannot break them without the grace of God. And then I'll look at the law of God that guides us and gives us direction on our path. We'll look at Psalm 51, the great miserere, which is prayed within the liturgy of the hours of the church every Friday on the day of the Lord's crucifixion and sacrificial death. So we'll spend a, an evening praying and meditating on the greatest of the penitential Psalms. Then we'll meditate upon Jonah, who was not happy about people repenting. He, he wanted to flee away from the responsibility of preaching the good news and eventually uh, by way of a whale or a big fish or whatever, the Lord took him and brought him back. Then we will look at something that's it's very important for us to consider as we experience the mercy of God to reflect upon how merciless we can be to others. So reflect upon Matthew and the way in which we have the servant who was forgiven so much but who then was so demanding of people who owed him so little. Then a great thing which reflects on the freedom we need to have and what enslaves us and what liberates us. And that is at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, just as we're approaching the, the Passion, we have the sheep and the goats, Judgment Day. And that certainly is to say about uh, the great Sam Johnson said about death, when a man knows he's gonna be hanged in a couple of weeks, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. Well, I think we need to have concentrated minds all the time and reflecting upon yes or no, which way are we going? Or as one of my favorite lines from the teaching of the 12 apostles, the Didache, there are two ways, the way to life and the way to death. And there is a great difference between them. So we'll meditate on that. Then the rich man and Lazarus, what is our life? What enslaves us in this world and what frees us? And that's very important. Then the prodigal son, of course, I've already mentioned that. And finally, some meditations upon Romans 12 and 13 about the freedom of the children of God, including the passage, which was the moment of liberation for St. Augustine from Romans 13, when he was all caught up in his own, well, every one of the deadly sins, you know, famously he said, oh Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. But, uh, but he pretty well had a, pretty well all of them he was caught up in, as he tells us in his confessions. But um, it's this passage from Romans that was the, the doorway to freedom, uh, not to spend our life in these useless things. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and take no account of the desires and the passions of the flesh. So with that spirit, we will now enter this year into the freedom of the children of God, the freedom of the kingdom of God by meditating upon the sources of our unfreedom, but with hope at the end of it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask you to, to hear our prayers, 
to send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may listen to your word. Free us from our sins, from all the burdens and the obstacles and the false gods that block the pathway to our heart. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, then kindle on us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Here we have the temptation that comes in the midst of the perfect garden of harmony. There we have man and woman living at peace with God and with nature. And yet into the midst of it, we have the slithering of the temptation and begins with doubt, begins with questioning. What is this? Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? He didn't, of course, simply say you don't eat of anything at all in the garden. But it's beginning to work a way to undermine the faith in the Lord God and the providence of God. Did he say this? Did he say that? What did he say? I mean, they've been given everything, and yet there are limits to the freedom. They, have the, they can go throughout the whole of the garden, but they are not God. Man and woman are not God. Good point we need to keep in mind. And so there is a certain limit, just very slight, to what they control. And so the serpent begins to insinuate himself into the, the mind of, of Eve and begins to get her to think and to question and to Think about 
how she may and how Adam may have been limited by their all gracious God. I think it's good for us to, to recognize how often these kinds of things can get within our own heads, where we can be tempted, of course, by the world, the flesh, and the devil, all these things, to take us away from that serene trust in the providence of God and thankfulness for what he has given us, to begin to wonder, I don't have enough. There's something that I don't have that I could control. I want more and we can be egged on to seek that. This is really where our restless hearts come from, where we are not content with the gift of God, with the harmony which he gives to us, always seeking more, seeking to, to be in control. And then we have no peace, no peace at all. The things within us that are just unsettled, rob us of peace. There's a great line, I think it was in the, in the rule of Benedict, where he says that a person responsible for a community not, might not be always suspecting things, or he will never have peace. <laughs> we can all get our minds going. I wonder about this, I wonder about that. Oh. And then we are just caught up in that. And life is too short for that. It's St. Augustine who certainly knew all about those mind games that to be played within us by one another, by the world, the flesh, and the devil. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So here we have man and woman in harmony, but now the insinuation of doubt, of this uneasiness, this suspicion, this questioning, but it's all done very subtly. The serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. The deepest problems we have do not come at us directly. They come at us from the side. I remember reading a very great book on strategy by Basil Littlehart, and his basic point of the whole two or 300 page book is, you don't go straight into the machine guns, you kind of go around the side. And that's, that's the way that life is, and it's certainly the way that Satan works, the way that we can work on one another, to just slightly chip away, chip away a little bit at the confidence of other people. How often have we done that? At their self-esteem? Just a little remark, you know, quite a little thing, a subtle little remark, but one that leaves a person just on edge, games people play. And our life is too short to play the games that the serpent is playing in the Garden of Eden. I remember hearing once, I forget where it was, I read somewhere in a book, I read a lot of books, about some professor said to a student, that's pretty good work, you know, pretty good. But I think, you know, you have sand in your foundations. Goodbye, walked away. Make the poor guy think, what did he mean? <laughs> oh, how we play these games with one another and how we ourselves can be so vulnerable. We can let people get into our heads and rule them. Just these subtle little remarks, you know. We don't have time for that. And it is destructive. We need not to slither. It's better to have very often someone directly criticized than to have that kind of little you know, kind of a mine left behind, ready to blow up a little thing. So now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Let's just ask the Lord to give us light in our own hearts. How often have we ourselves been stewing over something like that for days and days and days and weeks and years and maybe decades? Just getting all upset. But how often have we subtly put those little grenades and stuff, those little delayed bombs into just throw them into the people's lives as we go by them? Let's ask God's mercy if we have, and let's ask for God to give us some serenity if we encounter this.
Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, that's not actually what God said. What God said in chapter two, verse 17 is, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Eve has got it wrong. She says, she exaggerates what God has said. She makes it, she blows it up. She doesn't have an accurate read on what he said. He didn't say you don't even touch it. He said you don't eat of it. She's magnified it in her head and gotten it wrong. We can do that pretty well ourselves, can't we? We don't listen. We don't listen to God and we don't listen to one another. And that can cause us to, to get off track. You know, if a, if a ship is going along, it's a little bit off track at the beginning. It can go way off after a short time. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. It's just like so often that we see this, this misunderstanding of the law of God very frequently. All kinds of people go for long periods of their life with a misunderstanding of what the Catholic Church teaches, the message of the Lord God of the gospel, which we proclaim. And just a little clarification would bring a lot of peace of mind. So we gotta slow down and listen. And that's true, not only in listening to God, but in listening to one another. God gave us one mouth and two ears for a good purpose. We should just listen. And sometimes we don't listen because we're so caught up in what we think the other person, whether it be another person around us or God, what we think they're saying. Our own little ego gets in the way and we start creating what other people are saying. How often do we race ahead in a conversation to get our answer ready when we haven't actually listened, haven't paid attention to what is said? This can happen in a lot of ways. I remember a couple of years ago when I was in grade 13, when we had a grade 13, we had a, a test, I was doing the big final exam. Oh, it was a tough one, boy, this was, everything depended on it pretty well. And so I, I was amazed at how I got through the test quicker than everybody else, I was astonished. I walked out of the room thinking, well, gee, that wasn't that bad. And then at the end, uh, outside they were, finally the people came out and said, whoa, that last question about such and such was really difficult, wasn't it? And I said, what last question? <laughs> oh. I had forgotten to flip the paper over. There was another question. Oh my, anyway. <laughs> so like Eve, <laughs> we, can, we can, you know, let's just, let's just pay attention to what God is saying, what the church is teaching. Let's get it right. And to what we, one another, what we're saying. That's like the opening words of the rule of Benedict. Listen, my child, listen. And then obey God's will. So let's just ask God to help us to, we, we have enough trouble in life without getting things wrong, especially the law of God, messing it up. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so we begin to see the slithering deeper into her psyche. You will be like God. First of all, she sows suspicion about God. No, no, you will not die. Oh, he said they would if they eat of the tree. No, you won't die. So first is a contradiction there. But then he begins to undermine the credibility of God. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So first of all, he's subtly accusing God of trying to keep them from getting his power. And he's encouraging her to be suspicious. 
remember one point Pope Francis gave a very wise remark that the, the hermeneutic of suspicion is not healthy. That means if you go around suspecting everyone's motives all the time, well, you may actually hit it right occasionally, but this constant suspiciousness of, of here of God, and we do it all the time of other people, assuming the worst intentions, first of all, often, usually we're wrong, and that leads us into little corners, but also notice how it churns us up inside. We really just, this is absorbing, being absorbed in things which in our short life on earth, we just don't have time for. And so first of all, he gets her, he gnaws away, gets her suspicious of God's intentions. He's just trying to keep you down, isn't he? Don't you see that? And she'd be, oh, maybe he is, maybe he is. So we begin to start letting that work away. The little mind games begin to be played. Oh, how that can be done in a toxic social situation. That's too bad about, um, you know, someone. You know how often, especially very religious people, we can sometimes uh, say, well, I'll, we really must pray for this person. It's too bad their ex, whatever it is. So sad, I wish they were, we wish them well, you know. It's unfortunate about that, whatever. Well, oh, the games we play. So we pray the Lord to help us not to be that way. For you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, he's telling the truth there. They will end up knowing everything good and evil. They're gonna experience it pretty soon. But they're not gonna be like God. And yet the desire to be like God is the ultimate sin. To be who we are not. A little form of it is desire to be like other people. I wish I was this person or that person. But the desire to be like God, to control every tree in the garden, to know everything, good and evil also, but apart from knowing good and evil, it means knowing everything. A to Z, everything. You will be able to have it all. And that too begins to work upon her. First the suspicion, a little bit, maybe God's just trying to keep me down. Hmm, I wonder about that. Suspicion of the motives of God. And then the desire not to let that stop me from becoming God. And those two things, it's a one-two punch that the serpent subtly kind of gives to her in his sneaky little way. And again, within her mind, it begins to start rotting away <laughs> this, this corrosive effect of suspicion and ambition. You put them together, suspicion and ambition, and we have a toxic mix that's gonna blow. So let's ask the Lord to help us in that, to reflect the way that the serpent is playing with the mind of Eve. And just think, has that happened to me? Have I become like that? Bitter, suspicious, Maybe because I want to get ahead above someone else. Maybe I tear them down because that's my way of bringing myself up. I want to be in charge. That suspicion that can corrode our life and the ambition to really perhaps be like what we criticize. Whatever we most criticize another person of it's highly likely that's actually what we ourselves want. If you want to know what a person's really wanting, they just, what they're criticizing other people for. We all do that. So there's a whole spaghetti of complexity here. All the mind games within the mind of Eve and within the mind of each one of us. As the words of sacred scripture reflect reality into our lives, both the grace of God and his providence and also our own twistedness. One of the names for sin in Hebrew means twistedness, crookedness. 
So let's just ask the Lord to clear us of all that. Help us to be more upfront and clear and simple. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to her, her eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband and he ate. And look at how that goes. She's already got within her this, you know, kind of suspicion of the one who is the Lord, and then a bit of ambition to kind of be like God wondering maybe he's just trying to limit her. But then she begins to look at the, the fruit. And first of all, the real first attraction as she begins to contemplate the fruit, and we don't know what the fruit was. We always say it was, you know, it was an apple or something. Well, we don't know. This not, all this is is the fruit. They always say the problem in the Garden of Eden is not the apple on the tree, it's the pear on the ground. But, um, so she starts looking, it's good for food. I want it, it's good for food. But you don't want to be, admit that's your real motive. And it's a delight to look at, a little more aesthetic here. And it is to be desired to make one wise. Now that's the kind of rationalization that we can go with and we often do. So often and when we begin to start going off course, the real motivation is hidden under layers of rationalization from simply, I want it, to it is very beautiful, and to it will make me wise. So we always have to think about our motivation and do so honestly. And that's one reason it's good to get to confession a lot. Say, here I am, Lord, because the layers like layer upon layer of rationalization can, can build up a lot, quite a bit. And then what do we do? We fool ourselves. We cannot see ourselves as we truly are. We cannot see others. We cannot see God. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and though the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Now that's the sin. It's just the last point. All this time, she's been being tempted, but being tempted is not a sin. Temptation is a struggle. We're all tempted all the time. It's when we will to do, what is the temptation to make it happen, that's when we commit the sin. The sin is always an act of the will. And so we have gotta fend off these temptations and maybe if we've got a clear enough insight into ourselves and a humble enough spirit, we'll be able to see through these things that come at us. That's why like a very famous book, The Screwtape Letters, very good by C.S. Lewis, kind of going through all this, the, the, the armory of the, uh, of the tempter, of Satan. And we need to be uh, careful to think through that, to fend off the temptations. But ultimately, the sin occurs when we act on it. And so, it's complex. Satan is the father of lies. It always appears charming marvelous. Remember reading the brother Cadfell stories, it's wonderful detective stories from the Middle Ages when I, I've read about 20 of them. And um, finally about the 19th when I figured out the formula. <laughs> and it is that usually this knight in shiny armor turns out to be rotten and some poor soul who's struggling along turns out to be noble and honorable. And that, that can be the Satan, the temptation of any kind whether the world, the flesh, or the devil, usually does come by indirection and usually is rather attractive. The Antichrist, um, I think it was in one book, somebody said describes the Antichrist as having a doctorate in theology. 
from some famous German university. And if you want to see a book that Pope Francis recommends, and my gosh, it's a description of Canada, absolute, this thing called Lord of the World. And there's this guy, this is sort of the villain, Julian Felsenberg, who's just charming and oh, he's all the rest. But he's taking over all these countries, but he's, the, the villain is uh, very, very uh, suave and sophisticated. And so we often, you know, we sort of think we can get taken in. Um, and so we think of Canada, the United States, uh, Europe, uh, all of the world. We are very vulnerable to being taken in, not so much by uh, people who might seem uh, superficially negative, but by people sometimes we can, we can, we can really deceive other people. So let's pray to have the wisdom to see it. Not to be taken in by advertising, false advertising. And I think the easiest person to con is a person who is proud because they can take the bait every time and we have to think about our own hearts in that. So it's taken all this time to get Eve to sin. Adam, however, she gave some to her husband and he ate. So I'm afraid uh, <laughs> Eve, it was tough work for, poor serpent was just laboring away, going slithering this way and slithering that way to, to get Eve to, you know, playing these mind games with her and you know, get it. finally she ate. But she just gives it to Adam and <laughs> Hello. <laughs> there we are. What can I say? <laughs> there we are. <laughs> then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they so sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Well, they did get what was promised. You will, you will see. <laughs> well, where before their, their simple humanity was lived with innocence, now, because they're being dominated by control, wanting to be God, this kind of mind games, all these things, this no longer are they at harmony with one another. And so the whole of nature begins to un dis get discordant and their physical beauty and giftedness becomes a source of temptation, a source of shame. And they begin to feel the need to, they were ashamed. They were, feel the need to look for the fig leaves. And that's what happens when we lose our harmony of spirit. We can realize that it's not what we had imagined. One of the greatest poems on this is uh, one of the sonnets of of uh, Shakespeare, which is about lust, but this really is, this one here is more about pride, but the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action. And as you go through it bit by bit, you see the whole thing worked out just the way, in a sense of development further of this portion of scripture. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. All was so beautiful in harmony when they humbly were accepting the gifts of God as they came day by day. But now they want it all. Every tree has got to be mine. My precious, my precious, gotta be mine. Now they're discordant with one another. They are naked and ashamed and they're filled with fear and they're hiding in the bushes at the Lord who gave them all. One thing after another, there's a cascade, a cascade of breaking down of, of weakness, of discord when we begin to get off of that path of simple obedience. There's another use of naked that is in the English mystical tradition. It speaks of prayer as a naked intent unto God. 
And what that means is just, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Simple, unvarnished, just there. But this is hiding in the bushes because I'm afraid. And what they thought was going to be such joy being like God. Now they're not like God, they're hiding from God in the bushes. And I was afraid because I was naked. I was... So God, you would think at that point would say, well, I think I made a mistake with these two. And so boom, boom, just, but no, <laughs> that's not the Lord God. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? He obviously is trying to help them there and trying to reach out, you know, let's get slowly to kind of touch their conscience and begin to bring them back, although it will be a long journey and we haven't come to the end of it ourselves. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. So he's in one sort of, like he, he succeeds in blaming both God and his wife in one time. You know, the woman whom you gave to me, gave it to me and I ate. What could I do? It's like later on in the Old Testament when Aaron is, uh, you know, rebuked for the golden calf. He said, well, I just threw the gold in the fire. Out came a calf. Well, what could I do? Oh my, this is, you know, we kind of sort of laugh at it. We do this when we're little kids, you know. I don't know, my hands in the cookie jar. Oh, I don't know how I got in there, you know. But, <laughs> but this whole thing, blaming, you know, we, this lack of accountability. We're not accepting. That's like there's no better line than, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I have sinned. Or, or the prodigal son who was so blind, so much like Adam and Eve in the first part here. And he went off and he you know, did everything. But then he said, I will go to my father. I will say, Father, I am not worthy to be called your son. He gets his little speech ready, but he's taking responsibility. This is the foundation for the experience of God's mercy. It is it's always offered by God. But for us to be able to receive it, we really do need to be accountable. And if we're not, well, it doesn't work. Because ultimately, reality bats last. You know, driving down the 401 with a blanket over the windshield is very comfortable, but it's not safe. It's cozy, but not safe. Ultimately, we have to see what's out there and what's in here and what's in the Lord. If we, we can kind of play these games and these little illusions, I mean, she gave it to me, you gave it to me, that's your fault, it's her fault, it's, you know. Really? We need to simply say, I have sinned. It's my fault. I'm not gonna blame somebody else. Because only when we do that are we free to receive the freedom of the children of God. Because as long as we're playing games, what's the point? Life is too short. We gotta just realize there's just no time for this. That's why it's great to read the Confessions of Augustine. Oh, he was going everywhere, all these different things. Finally, he woke up and said, look, enough. I'm gonna start living with integrity. And so the God said, to the woman, and what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. So Adam blames God and Eve, Eve blames the serpent. The poor serpent slept there. <laughs> there we are. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. That is the fate of serpents, to be slithering along the ground. It's sort of, you know, lovers of snakes would probably not like this passage, but it is a sign, it's a symbol, it's meant to speak to us because the uh, serpents are, first of all, they can be beautiful, I suppose, if you like serpents. They are slithering along the ground. They don't go directly, but kind of indirectly, which is a lot of our troubles in life come from indirection. 
And uh, they're very dangerous, they can be. Indirect and dangerous. That's a pretty good description of what causes a lot of trouble in life. Subtle and dangerous. Whenever we have people in the world we deal with who are subtle and dangerous, watch out. And a serpent sort of visually symbolizes that, although I don't want to be you know, down on serpents. But the serpent is a perfect sign and symbol of those slithery things, which we really have to just get away from that. Or we will go down on the ground. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The seed, the descendant of Adam and Eve is of course Christ the Lord, who will conquer the serpent in the sense of the power of evil and the power of Satan, the power of the world, the flesh and the devil. And in the course of it, his heel will be bruised it's not an easy thing, but the serpent's head will be crushed. The strife is o'er, the battle won, now is the victory begun. And that's what we're in right now. This is the world we're in, where the battle is continuing. And yet the victory is of Christ our Lord. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we do not yet have still the serpent, the dragon is still flailing around. That's what a theme that's picked up in chapter 12 of the book of Revelation, which is the symbol of this cathedral and of our archdiocese. The dragon against a, a pattern of harmony of white and red diamonds of different combinations, but in harmony, but against it, the head of the dragon and through the dragon, the sword, which is the victory of Christ. But the dragon still flails his tail and the serpent still has venom in the fangs. But we do not fear that, but we must fight that, whether we see it in the world outside of us or in the way it can insinuate into our hearts. We must fight that with confidence in the presence and the providence of God in the strength which we receive from Christ our Lord, which is represented to us, especially here in this place, by Michael. The statue is behind the cathedral here, whose symbol is on fighting the dragon, is on the crest of our basilica and our cathedral. And in the prayer that I want everyone to be praying a lot, and I think at the end of mass is a good time to do it. It speaks to us of what Leo XIII, the great Pope, said in the latter part of the 19th century when he saw what was lying ahead. This kind of evil we see that is just cascading outward from this experience we see here. And so he wrote the great prayer. Say, Michael the Archangel, defend us in this day of battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden by the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. 
And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to me be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, and what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.